Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our session today. I'm Amir Tangistani, and I'm here with Gus Spanos. Uh, we're from Kazan Architecture. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, a very challenging project that, that we're still working on, Stanton Hospital, Territorial Hospital. Uh, before getting into the presentation, I uh, just wanted to say a few words why we chose that title for the presentation today, Project Data Management through BIM. Uh, so basically, BIM was utilized and uh, was used uh, extensively throughout the project for uh, from design to analysis for decision-making purposes, uh, coordination, communication, integration, uh, a lot of keywords you've probably heard uh, today in other presentations to you. Uh, but why, why data? At the core of all of those, uh, that letter I in, in, in the terminology PIM sits information and data and, and how we deal with those data. And speaking of hospital projects, uh, that data has uh, a different significance compared to other typical commercial institutional projects. Uh, when we're talking about hospital, we're, uh, we're in the process of creating and maintaining a lot of data. And uh, from wall schedules to door and hardware schedules to signage, equipments, room finishes, uh, it's, it's just a, a, a big, of, of data that has to be maintained. Uh, more specifically to this project, uh, we had to create a, a live, uh, what we called a live room data book. So what that entails was basically room information such as all the areas, all the room ID information, adjacencies, acoustics, lighting, accessories, medical devices, ICT controls, HVAC, fire rating, wall protection, doors, plumbing, medical gases, et cetera, et cetera. So just think about it. That uh, live room data book is supposed to be that one uh, reference book for the project to be maintained throughout the project life cycle and always has to have the latest and the greatest information of the project. And that information is to be obtained from so many different stakeholders from different phases of the project and uh, in many different transitions that, that has to happen between Design to construction, construction to uh, to handover to the to the operations and uh, all the all the people that are going to be joining and leaving the process. So uh, just wanted to start with that. As part of that, we're talking about protocols, creating and maintaining data, and those protocols are usually dictated by uh, the owners' requirements and uh, whatever the deliverables are going to be. So uh, that's another piece of the equation there. I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm not even sure how this works. There we go. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to do a very quick introduction to uh, Kazian Architecture, who we are. Uh, Gus, I, I'm going to hand it over to Gus. Gus will talk about uh, the project itself, uh, an intro to the project, and then he will talk about some of the challenges that we face on this project. Uh, either generally, generally to, the, to the hospital projects or specifically to, to the Stanton Territorial Hospital. And then he will hand it back to me. I'm going to talk about how PEM could facilitate some of those issues. And then we're going to wrap up the session. So Kazian Architecture uh, was founded in 1983 by Don Kazian. Uh, we serve pretty much any any market in the construction industry from cultural, educational, government, healthcare, hospitality, industrial, office towers, sports and recreation, residential and mixed use, retail, transportation, workplace, you just call it. Uh, the services we offer include mainly architecture, interior design, facilities management, uh, sorry, facilities planning, master planning, and integrated design. We currently have four, uh, five locations uh, across the globe, four in Canada, and we have uh, 240 full-time staff, out of which we, uh, the 180 are uh, heavy BEM users. And what I mean by that is all the projects uh, that we currently start at KZN, they, they are all initiated uh, all the way through completion in, in a BEM environment. 
So with no further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to Gus to talk about the project itself. Uh, thank you, Amir. Uh, I just want to uh, give you an overview of uh, Stanton Territorial Hospital. Uh, it's a hospital, yes, but it's, uh, the project delivery is slightly different. It has different uh, requirements, and they're all data heavy, uh, adding uh, on top of the normal uh, data requirements for a hospital. Um, this is, if I can just, there's a, a little film here that we produced during the pursuit stage to uh, give an overview of what the hospital might look like. Again, it's, a, it's the hospitals in the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife. Um, it's a P3 partnership project, a public-private partnership, and we're part of the Boreal Partnership Group that uh, consists of Bird, Clark, uh, and Turner Construction Group, uh, and uh, Carillion FM Management. And $350 million total project cost. Uh, this is the, uh, the animation, that, as I said, that we produced. The original hospital is that other building in the background, which was part of an indicative design, which is normal in a, in a P3 project. Uh, we abandoned the, uh, the indicative design because through st strategic uh, planning and thought, we thought it would be more uh, advantageous overall to build a new hospital rather than renovating and expanding the existing hospital whilst trying to deliver health care uh, during construction. Originally it was planned for five years, we've, d we've uh, cut it down to three years. This is a typical hospital uh, um, configuration of, of uses where you have a two-story uh, uh, ambulatory care po podium, let's call it, and the inpatient tower which consists of uh, the mental health on level three and levels four and five is inpatient and medical wings. It's, you know, it, you know, the, as you see it here, this is, this is the end of the animation, more or less, but the hospital has changed very little in terms of the design evolution from the concept design that you see here. And at the outset, we were challenged just in terms of maintaining the data that, we were give, that was given to us, but also having to create data that goes along with the next, uh, with the evolution of the, of the design and construction. So what are the challenges, especially in a P3 and, P3 environment, um, you know the pre-planning that uh, what's required in the uh, the the project the PA the project agreement. There's data that has to be maintained and 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 given to us, but also data that's created. So we have to start pre-planning and making sure with our BIM execution plan that we that we worked on, but also. Uh, keeping in mind as we go through the various stages of what that data is, what it means, and how it's interpreted. Um, then, there, of course, there's, uh, you know, when we have, when I talk about pre-planning, there's one thing in particular that we had to address that was unusual from from my perspective, not being a BIM user, being an architect. So, excuse me. Um, it's in, in in the healthcare environment. Each room sometimes has two or three program components that have to be taken care of. For instance, it's a, in a patient room, we have to have um, the caregiver area, the patient area, and the family area. Those are all separate program areas that comprise one room. Those are the some of the challenges that were, that are not uh, uh, in, in the, were not part of uh, normal work in, in the old days, quote unquote. Uh, then we have design, design coordination between not only ourselves internally, but also all the other consultants which have their own sets of requirements that need to be addressed as part of the PA agreement, the project agreement. You know, there are constant revisions through the, um, through the, through the uh, several, sta the, the various stages of the project with continual data update and management. Those are the real challenges that, that I've found in particular uh, uh, that's, that, that, that BIM has, has brought to the fore. Uh, we have, co you know, coordination of revisions with consultants, you know. Each discipline has their own model that, we, that they have to produce and integrate it with ours, and how is that coordinated? I know there's a lot of people, there's a few people in the room that have first-hand knowledge of, that have worked on this project already, and they know the, the challenges that entails, and who hosts, not to get too technical, who hosts what element in the BIM, in the BIM model. And also keeping track of all the owner requirements and changes. There's constant changes through the evolution of the project, especially in healthcare, because each and every room, especially as I say, especially in healthcare, each and every room has very intense technical requirements. Even in an exam room, which is a small eight by ten room, we've all experienced exam rooms. Each one of those rooms 
can be a project in and of itself. So you can multiply that over 1,500 different rooms that, that sometimes are similar but not quite. So those are the challenges that, that, that are entailed with, with just in planning. If we go to, then we have maintenance of all that data. How do we keep track of all that stuff? Um, you know, the, 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 the sheet on the right, that's the room data sheet that, that for each and every room, each 1,500 spaces has the data that comprises of what that room is supposed to be, how it's supposed to function. And again, it evolves through the data, through the evolution and working with the client group to ensure that the data that's, that's first, address, first given to us is accurate and, is, as it, and it also serves their own function for each space. You know, there's also the, you know, the other spaces, you know, um, and that has to be kept track of, again, throughout the, each phase of, of, the, of the construction. Uh, but there's also gaps and sometimes in the information that we, we, we receive, which, you know, is always challenging, but normally speaking through a regular process, we receive information from the owners of what uh, the space has to be, the functionality of that space, the equipment that goes into that space, and all the furniture, the FF&E that goes into that space. And, and sometimes that isn't, that isn't uh, readily available. Sometimes we get it in piecemeal, as, in, as is the case with this particular project. So, for instance, a piece of equipment will influence the scale and the size and the function of each room. It will affect the mechanical electrical requirements. Those all have to be addressed. So, again, those are the challenges that, that, that we faced. And it's, uh, in normal projects, yes, they're, they're like that, but they're magnified much more in, in a hospital project as well as the P3 setting. Those things that magnify those, those challenges. Communication. How do you communicate all these changes as the project goes through? We have fast track construction. The, if anyone in the room has been involved in a P3 project, they're uh, concentric or uh, parallel paths that uh, it's not a, a typical design bid build where there's uh, everything happens almost in a silo. There's, there's, there's a beginning and end to each function or each uh, program phase. It doesn't really happen in a fast track project, especially in a P3, where we're vet, trying to vet and, 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 and ensure that the program and the design requirements are, are to the satisfaction of the authority at the same time we're building. In this particular case, if some of you in the room, you know what stage we're at. We're about 60%, 50% uh, uh, construction of the building. We haven't got full sign off on all the clinical design. So we're still doing that. So all that information has to get tr kept track of and, and be updated on a continual level. Any changes through the, the design process have to be communicated directly to the site. And again, multiple tendering packages. Sometimes we don't have all the information that we need to tender uh, certain packages. So those are the other, uh, again, another layer of challenges that we have to address through, hopefully through BIM. And uh, again, even though we're fast tracked, we know there's going to be multiple changes and, and coordination through all these revisions. Because of the nature of this project, they're not distinct, uh, compact, or discrete aspects like you would have in design, bid, build. There, there's fluid changes and fluid uh, dynamics in, 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 uh, in this, this particular process. So, you know, we try to, to encompass all those challenges into one big, you know, um, what's, the, what's the term? The, one place for the truth. I think that uh, not quite sure what the term is, but you, you know what I'm talking about. So we're trying to have 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 a, a central repository for all the things that that are true to this project. So all those challenges uh, are again from from a uh, architect's perspective are uh, you know we need to have this tool. I hate to say it, but you know in the old days you know, that's why I have gray hair. We used to draw with paper and keep track of everything by hand. Here, everything's magnified, and since we have this tool, we have to be able to, to deal with it. And from my perspective, uh, this is my third P3 process, but you know we refined it several times, and it's still a challenge no matter what. And I think the earlier, um, the previous speaker talked about trying to have a, a consensus on protocols and, and so on. So 
that's sort of the challenges that, that we faced and we still face on a daily basis on this particular project. A project, I should say. And I'd like to hand it back to Amir and, uh, for him to, to be able to illustrate how we've been able to deal with these challenges going forward on this project. So back to you, Amir. Thank you, Gus. So, uh, well, uh, as you see, Gus has uh, been breathing this project for the past three and a half three years. And a half years. So those are some very good insights on uh, where we sit in terms of the challenges uh, that we've been facing on a daily basis on this project. Uh, now I'm going to step back a little and uh, talk about how BEM could address some of those issues. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at it from uh, different, different perspectives. Uh, the first one, BIM being a, a common a platform in common language. I think this uh, terminology, exact terminology, was used previously in another presentation today. So uh, we, we need a common language. If, we, if we're having multiple stakeholders using their own tools, their own protocols, and, and their own uh, communication ways uh, coming around the same table and and doing uh, one project together we, we need a common uh, a common ground in there and BIM could act as that common language so what that means for for a project like like uh, Stanton is uh, you basically have a BIM execution plan at the very uh, early stages of the project that you can set some of those protocols through uh, the, uh, the, the, the things that you basically come to consensus uh, on with everybody else for that project. Uh, things such as, uh, as, as easy as naming conventions all the way to LODs. I'm sure you're all familiar, for those you know, familiar level of development or detail that is uh, basically agreed on in, in different phases of the project what formats are going to be used, who owns what, and what type of file exchange protocol we're talking about, and uh, what are the methods of coordination throughout the project, and uh, the parameters that are going to be used throughout the project, and uh, based on the requirements for facilities management, either they are dictated by the, the program requirements or the client, or if there is nothing there so you can agree on something, so it is a consistent handover at the end of the, at the, end of the project. So uh, that, that would be the one, one main aspect of having BIM uh, on the project. And then, and then another aspect uh, that, that BIM would definitely facilitate on the project is what uh, in, in computer science they call it a single version of the truth, or SVOT. So what that means is basically, uh, as you see in the illustration here, BIM would, be, would become that central database for all the project information. Uh, there, is, there is no more redundancy when, when you, you adopt a, a, a model like this. Uh, when that happens, it, it makes it much easier for you to, to merge the data because, uh, for example, as an architect, you, you're always dealing, especially in a hospital project, you're always dealing with uh, bringing in the mechanical and electrical information into your drawings. So instead of going and taking that information from multiple locations and not being sure what's happening and what's the latest and the greatest, you can always rely on that central source of data and you always you're always sure that the data that you're using is the latest and the greatest. Uh, also, having that framework set at the beginning and having that central source of data, uh, it makes it much easier to, to get into a finer level of detail uh, in modeling and, and uh, putting the data into the model versus dealing with so many different versions of the same data and uh, getting distracted by coordinating that high level so you can't really get into a finer level of detail there. It also, uh, what, what proved to be very, uh, very useful for us in this project, having, having a central source of data allows for what we call program validation. So as Gus mentioned, uh, one of the challenges we had was we had the program dictated by the client and we always have to make sure that we're complying with that. So how do we do that? Uh, having a central source of data allows you to freeze uh, your, your information at any point 
create a baseline, and then as you're maintaining your information, you can always compare it to, to that baseline. Uh, that baseline could also be compared to, to whatever the, the program requirements has been. So it allows you to do comparison scenarios. The, the, nec the, ne the next aspe aspect I, I want to talk about is uh, the fact that in the BIM environment, uh, you have the luxury of, of uh, creating a live connection. What that live connection means is basically as you, as you maintain that central source of data, which is your uh, single source of truth, uh, you can always uh, access it in real time. And what that means is it will make your collaboration much easier and much more efficient, which will help a lot with your change management processes. At the same time, uh, you're, you're basically uh, doing data management in a much more efficient manner. And uh, what that means is basically you can access, you can extract from that information uh, at, at any time from wherever you are, and you're always sure that you have access to the latest and the greatest especially on this project because we had uh, consultants working across Canada. Uh, that live connection meant a lot instead of uh, basically doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations all the time. It, it basically BIM allows you to have someone moving, let's say the mechanical consultant moves a dock, you, you can immediately see that in your, in your architectural and you can change your interior partitions or vice versa or pick up the phone. So it just makes the whole change management process much, much more efficient. Uh, my last uh, slide here is uh, about automation. So another aspect that uh, BIM brings to the project is helping out with automation. And what that is is basically more efficient uh, workflows and uh, minimizing human errors in, in the process. Uh, and definitely helps out with having a more consistent uh, deliverable for every submission that you have uh, from, from DD to CD. Uh, it just, uh, because you, you're taking out the human factor, so it's, it's, it's more efficient, it's, it's, aut it's automated, and there's less error. Uh, examples of that could be creating schedules, doing design-related computations, uh, just as, as easy as having live wall or building sections, plans, roof plans, elevations, and extending them into details would allow you to actually create all that information automatically. And also templated views would help a lot with the process as an architect. So uh, these, are, these are all the things that, that would basically end up saving you time and money uh, eventually on the project. So this takes us to, to wrap up notes, uh, try to keep our presentation within the, the 35 minutes that we were given. So I'm hoping uh, we're kind of on time, trying to push uh, back the schedule a little bit. We were behind a little. So uh, in terms of the wrap up notes, uh, we, we, we both wanted to kind of wrap it up together. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the project, the BIM was used uh, in order to uh, facilitate a lot of things in this project. from sustainability studies to better coordinated production documents uh, because of the parametric nature of the BIM. We used it for uh, design assist and uh, it, we also used it for intelligent integration with our specification language. Externally, it, it helped improve our communication, uh, better implemented our des design decisions and uh, we definitely had much fewer RFIs on the, on, along the way. And uh, it was a much better coordinated construction phase for sure. So uh, I, I would like, to, my takeaway uh, for you, hopefully for this session would be, none of this would have been possible if in the first place BIM was not used as a data management tool because at the center of, at the core of all that aspects, there is, uh, there is data. And if the data is not maintained, and if it's not up to date, and if it's not accessible, uh, the rest of it is basically rotating around that, that, that concept. So it's very important to, to uh, maintain that, that central source of data. Uh, 
just a little bit of wrap up for me. Uh, the BIM aspect of what I do as an architect, uh, it's become a not, a, not so much revolution, it's evolution in terms of the final product. What we see around us, this building, this environment, that's the end goal here from my perspective is to uh, define the building, define the, the three-dimensional object that we're designing. And what BIM allows us to do is uh, transition from the old school of we design, we, we get a contractor, we get the contract to build, we get, uh, we get on site, we make any changes. I think what, what BIM allows us to do is, is, is uh, transition from that. We've done that, we started this already. You know, Kate's been in, involved intimately about uh, taking the BIM model and taking it to the next phase where the constructors and the sub-trades are co coordinating even more detailed models for themselves to be able to fabricate pieces and uh, deliver it to the site and, and assemble it there. So there's an evolution going on that that BIM has allowed us to do to change the, the manner in which we construct buildings, hopefully more advantageously, more uh, um, uh, sustainably, and so on. And I think that's what the BIM allows us to do. There's a lot of data there that we have to manage, but the end game is this, what we see, what we, what we inhabit. So the evolution has come, I think, and as I said, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution, it's a slow transition to a different methodology of construction. And I think that's what BIM uh, allows us to do. Thank you, gentlemen, for that. Uh, you talked uh, three to five years, if I understood yeah, from, correctly. From five to three years. Oh, five to three. Five to so three have years. you quantified those results and also like from detailed design into, or documents into construction? you know, the less clash, the less changes and so forth. Have you been able to quantify through that project what it meant for financial results? I think that, is this on? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, the consortium, we, we did a, again, this is uh, at the outset, the indicative design uh, was, a, uh, was an addition and renovation to the existing building, and the estimated construction period was five years. We looked at it fairly closely, the construction part of the team said it's probably more like six, and the other aspect of it was that we, the mandate was to construct, renovate, uh, add to the building, in various phases. I think 10 or eight phases were in the indicative design with several sub-phases within each phase. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what the disruption would be to the, not only to the people who work there, but also the patients. So that, that puts another layer of, of infection control issues. That's another story with the hospital. So, you, so our strategy was not only to uh, lessen the, uh, the potential of infection within the, within the environment, but also reduce the, the cost to the owner overall, and also main, maintain the, the functionality of this existing hospital till the new hospital is ready to open. So that, you know, intrinsically we know that. We did a, a sort of a data a matrix of, of advantages and disadvantages. We put some money, uh, we, there's some money values that were put to there. I wasn't privy to that, but I know that that was done. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gone with that particular strategy. It was quantified. It's then. quantified, yes, indeed. Thank you. Now, Project Charter, before I open up to the floor, uh, when, you, when you talk about this, I'm, I'm presuming as I listen <laughs> that you were dealing uh, with the COBE approach, uh, that there was standard file uh, uh, approaches. So like. IFCs as an example. So mm -hmm. I wonder, you bring Turner Clark, you bring Bird, yeah. Casey, and, yes. and the engineering teams. Correct. What have you. Was that part of the project charter and coming together as a team that everybody would have a data management capability in house and how you're setting naming conventions? Or did that happen after you got going I, into the project? 
process? That, that happened after we got going into the project. We, at, when we started the project, we had to start with, you know, a lot of the consultants worked together before uh, Bird and, and Casey have worked together mm -hmm. numerous times, mm -hmm. but there was other consultants, as Amir mentioned, from Toronto that we hadn't worked with. So we had to sit down and go through uh, the naming conventions and, and yeah. go through that so, so that we wouldn't get caught in the middle of, did you mean this or did you, did you mean that? The, yeah. the, the protocol was set, set at the outset. So yeah. again, that, that's what I talk about, pre-planning, because yes. these particular projects, they go light speed from the get-go. As soon as the, the, uh, we're named as a, the preferred proponent, the clock starts to tick. Yeah. So everything starts going very, very quickly, That's very quickly. Uh, questions from the floor? No? We answered everyone's questions, awesome. How, how about, um, did you get into waste management? Can I just add to that answer? Yes, please. Uh, so just, just to add to what Gus mentioned, uh, uh, on, on the other hand, we didn't have, uh, we don't have a very sophisticated client uh, in terms of uh, the handover they're respecting. So at mm -hmm. least that was the case at the very front end of the project. So mm -hmm. they, they didn't specifically ask for what they wanted. Uh, so we, we had to do that planning uh, internally uh, just to make sure that uh, because we, we understand for, for such projects there is a standard in terms of moving, moving forward with BIM in the future. So we wanted to basically make sure our, our bases are covered in terms of the, the type of handover that we provide for facilities right. management. So we, we had that internally, but it was not dictated to us. So it is, it is a Kobe ready, Kobe compatible, uh, basically platform that, that is kind of uh, being worked through by, by, by the contractors and, and the trace too. But uh, there were no requirements set by the, by the client for this. They provided a migration path so as the operator profiles matured, you could build u yes. user interfaces Definitely. according. Exactly. Educating. Very sure. cool. Yeah. Um, and my last question, uh, oh, there is one, thank you. Uh, with respect to the waste management, dealing with the supply chain, um, this whole data management strategy, and I don't want to presume, but I have to ask, did you take that into account from the material science, the supply chain, right down to how do you reduce waste? Was that part of your plan? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> short answer is no. But the that's more of a uh, a constructor question. We you know we what we do is is define the building and we do show the design intent and 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 try to uh, conform to the requirements of the project agreement and so on. Uh, in terms of uh, data stream, in terms of uh, actual materials and loss. For, I, I would pr I'm, I'm putting uh, words into Bird Clark's mouth that, that it is in Yellowknife. The transportation costs are quite high. Right. So they, they, need, they also have their own internal um, management in terms of supply and what kind of materials and how to get it up there yeah. uh, uh, to Yellowknife. I'll give you a, a, an anecdote. One of the, at the outset of the design stage, you know, in level zero, which is the sort of the, the, the back of house area and, and uh, um, you know, basically uh, the, where all the, you know, the, the dirty spaces where the, where the uh, uh, materials management is and so on. That's usually in a hospital's concrete block because it takes a lot of abuse. Well, first of all, concrete block, it, it has to be shipped from, Winnip sorry, not Winnipeg, but uh, Edmonton. Where do you get masons? Where do you get concrete? Where do you, so all those sorts of things have to be taken into account. So uh, under normal circumstances, I'd build a hospital with concrete frame. So there's no concrete plant anywhere near Yellowknife. So we had to switch to steel, which added another layer of complexity in, into the project in terms of fireproofing and so on, and vibration control, those sorts of things. So. All those things were taken into account as part of the, the, build, the build strategy and pursuit strategy at the, at the beginning of the project. I love these uh, events like this, sharing knowledge, experience, yeah. very cool. <coughs> Sir, you had a question. Well, you talked a lot about in, you know, the fact that with a hospital, you have a very large, very complex set of requirements. Mm -hmm. How were those requirements, as you, you, know, you were saying, the client was not necessarily very sophisticated, how were those requirements delivered to you and what was the process for 
gathering that data and then validating that data. Okay. Uh, uh, there's two two basic requirements that were given to us to design the hospital. One is the schedule of accommodation, which is the program areas, as I was saying earlier, uh, some program areas, uh, some rooms comprise three or four program areas individually to make up that one room. The schedule of accommodation and the clinical clinical specifications. So those, th those two, and also, uh, not to dwell on it too, too much, uh, the equipment schedule. So the, those three elements re are the major points of data that are given to us. There are also several other types of requirements that uh, are mandated, you know, things like building code requirements, uh, CSA Z8000 requirements. Um, there's uh, uh, data management requirements that are all embedded in the PA agreement, the, pro the project agreement. So all those bits of data, there's, there's sheets and sheets of, of uh, uh, control documents that are embedded in the PA that we have to deal with. Um, as we go, f go forward, as we are going forward in the project, there's um, at different stages, there are control documents that are reviewed and commented on by the authority. And in, in our particular case, in most P3 cases, there's the um, Schedule 3, which is the design and construction protocols. Uh, CSA, in our case, CSA Z8000, which was a governing document. It is not normally a governing document. It's, it's a suggested or, or uh, guidelines to, to how to design uh, healthcare facilities. But in, as I said, in this case, it was a, it was a control document. And also uh, uh, Appendix 3A, which is the clinical requirement. So all those things are tracked throughout each stage. So, but that's just the information that, were, that was given to us. There are other aspects that we have to deal with too. Data that we created ourselves throughout the project as Amir alluded to earlier, which was, let's say, the, 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 the door schedule, door hardware, uh, acoustic requirements between each space, all those sorts of things has, have to get tracked. And we had to create our own documents to be able to track those and, e and easily uh, um, go to that information if we, if we wanted to. I don't say it was easy, it was very difficult, frankly, because there was interpretations of different groups that are part of the project, uh, acoustic, uh, let's say acoustic requirements between two spaces. Our acoustic consultant interpreted one way, we interpreted another way, someone else can interpret it another way. So those are the, the challenges that we were faced by creating our own data that wasn't given to us. So that's how we kept track of everything. The room data sheets is another place where we have, to, where again, through the evolution of the design, some of the aspects of the room data sheets have to be updated because it doesn't really reflect, reflect reality. Room data sheets are abstract. You know, here's a, here's a standalone room, let's say an exam room. It has all these requirements, fine, okay. But if you put an exam room beside another space, like a, um, a trauma room or something like that, it doesn't usually happen, but I'm just saying that, hello? Uh, but, you know, then things have to get uh, uh, changed and, and, and updated as we go along. So those are the real challenges. And as I said, there's 1,500 rooms that have to be addressed each and every one. So I don't know if that's this, answered your question. This is a big discussion and it's gonna go on like the cloud collaboration. Yeah. Like I love this stuff. Yeah. We have a team dedicated yeah. to this. Cloud collaboration, yeah. the as built, the change management of it. I mean, there's, this is a big topic. It, it is a big topic. And again, in, in terms of P3 also, there's a 30 year concession, I think it's a 30 year concession mm -hmm. for this particular hospital. So the data that is that comes out at the end of the project, okay, we hand it over to the FM operator, this, in this case, Carillion. What do they do with it? There's still, we give them a certain amount of information that are, we're contractually obligated to, but I'm sure, I am know they want more stuff. Like, okay, w this piece of equipment here, where can I find the, the, the data for that, you know, the power requirements, the uh, warranty requirements for that piece of equipment? We can do that, from my, my understanding, we can do all that and put that into the BIM model, but that takes time and effort and money. So that's, I think, that's the next stage. What are the, what are the uh, requirements, the LOD, as we talk about, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, as I said, it's becoming an evolutionary methodology that isn't quite there yet.
to drive the results will require the life cycle, the yeah. asset information, yeah. post asset information. Not and only that's where we're going to quantify much of the financial well, and productive. Not only loose right. things like this, but also the envelope, the, right. exactly. the fabric of the building. Warranty, on and yeah, on and on. Exactly. I, and I can tell you you've got more questions, and as the facilitator, I've got to somewhat try to keep this okay. on time. So maybe over a pint later, okay. a wee libation yeah. of some sort. Yeah. Um, thank you both very much. Thank you. That was, that was great discussion. Appreciate having you.